the cancer of relativism to infect us, so we think there are no shared universal values, and there is no freedom without those shared universals. Feit is iets wat je niet kan waarderen wanneer je het helemaal hebt. Je moet het een tijdje niet hebben en dan pas begrijp je wat je mist. Reverse the question. Can art destroy the world? And I think it can. You can choose either to be abused or not. We hacked into the audience and then all of a sudden 300 phones would ring, you know. Good evening everyone here in the Bali and uh, welcome for this new political and societal season. And we open the season with uh, a very honored guest and we're really happy uh, to announce him here this evening tonight. Michael Ignatieff, thank you so much for being with us. Um, I will introduce you later on a little bit more, but of course he is well known as both, uh, both a politician, a writer, a scientist and over the last year as the president of the Central European University in Budapest. And we will talk about the situation on this university in regards of the uh, Hungarian government, but also in broader extents about the situation in Europe in regards of the question how to battle the democratic freedom. And this program is part of an ongoing debate uh, uh, in the Bali together with uh, the Forum of, on European Culture about situation in Europe in regarding uh, the political and society impact Europe has on us civilians and how this impact is being changed over the last years and what this means for the near future. In 2080, the Bali again will have a very long uh, amount of talks and debates on this, in this program, but to, um, to, to, to work our way in a, in, a, in a certain sense, we have on a regular basis evenings like this about free speech, um, free thinking, free journalism and so on. Um, Tonight will be introduced and opened by Bastian Rijpkema. He is a legal philosopher. Uh, he teaches in Leiden University. Um, and his book, uh, last book in 2016, called Weerbare Democratie, Militant Democracy, was honored uh, as the best political book of 2016. It has been translated. It's almost ready, I understand. You're doing the last uh, translation uh, as we speak, sort of. So militant democracy is also being available on uh, the English market in some months. Uh, and you're going to, um, to introduce the topic. Um, you have been uh, writing about the question if democracy should be militant in its, uh, in its, in its own right. Should it also use anti-democratic weapons and means to defend democracy uh, itself? Give him a big hand, Bastian Rijpkema. Around the world, we see democracy being challenged in diverse ways. In the United States, a president was elected who suggested that he might not accept the outcome of the elections, who says he is in a running war with the media, described by him as the enemy of the people, and Trump also held an individual judge who had blocked his travel ban accountable for any possible terrorist attacks. Within the EU, in Hungary, Orban is building his self-declared illiberal state. He has, among other things, severely restricted the powers of the constitutional court, closed the last serious opposition newspaper in October 2016, and in 2017 targeted one of Hungary's most prominent universities, the Central European University. Orban's tinkering with the political playing field leaves experts doubting if the opposition is still able to win elections with some, as the Hungarian Harvard economist Janos Kornai, even describing Hungary as an autocracy. Then there are also serious worries inside the EU. 
regarding the developments in Poland and outside the EU in one of its most important partners on what's happening in Turkey. There's a lot of bad news. How should we see all this? It's important to note that we are not talking about fragile, new and developing democracies per se. No, we are talking about the United States, the country with the oldest still functioning constitution in the world and about EU member states and EU preferred partners. How is it possible that these countries with some form of democratic tradition being partners or member states of the EU look so vulnerable? The reason I think is in democracy itself. Democracy is of course a very important and a good functioning invention of political philosophy, but it's also intrinsically vulnerable. A democracy also gives its enemies the rights to fight that same democracy. But isn't that exactly what a democracy should do? Being neutral to all political competitors in her arena. Are these not just normal developments in democracy? Isn't this what it is all about? Letting every ID compete for the vote of the people. In other words, we need to think through what democracy really is about. Why is it that we value democracy so much? A common answer is, well, we have nothing better or something to that effect. Such an answer goes back, of course, to the perpetually repeated wisdom of Winston Churchill. Democracy is the worst form of government, except all those others that have been tried. I want to show you a very different answer. And we find this answer in the work of a Dutch constitutional thinker, George van den Berg. In his 1936 inaugural lecture as a professor of constitutional law in Amsterdam, he formulated the first political philosophical foundation for militant democracy. In my book, Weerbare Democratie, which indeed will be published in English later in 2018, I built on Van den Berg's work to develop a comprehensive theory of democratic self-defense. The recurring question in it is, given the very diverse challenges to democracy, when should we say, this is where we draw the line? This proposal, ID or change to the democratic system is something a democracy, when the threat is serious and acute, should not allow. Van den Berg draws such a line. In a democracy, Van den Berg argues, all decisions are revocable. The people govern themselves through a process of continuous self-correction. They make their own decisions, are confronted with the consequences of their decisions and amend previous decisions when they deem this necessary. But there's one choice that escapes this very process, and that's the decision to abolish democracy. This one decision destroys the very framework that makes self-correction possible in the first place. It's a decision that the people can never peacefully repair. This is why a democracy says Van den Berg, and I say, say this with him, this is why a democracy should be allowed to oppose this one decision. The principle of self-correction is the basis for the theory of militant democracy I propose. Of course, there are a lot of questions left to answer. When, for instance, is self-correction actually threatened? What should a democracy then actually do in its defense? What measures can it take? And how do you prevent abuse of these preventive mechanisms? How do you translate all this into a workable legal provision? I cannot go into these issues here. I, went, I want to end by noting that ultimately every democracy, either procedural or substantive in theory, has some kind of mechanism to protect itself. This applies to the German democracy, where anti-democratic political parties can be banned, as well as to the prototypical procedural democracy of the United States, where parties are not banned, but the two-party system is taught to render not only anti-democrats, but also political outsiders almost chanceless, although one could say that the 2016 elections have shown otherwise. The ex exclusion of anti-democrats, though not always achieved by legal means, is a reality in many democracies. Anti-democratic parties are banned or excluded in more other subtle ways. 
These exclusions, however, need to be justified explicitly. And the question is how, and to this question the theory I develop hopes to give an answer. But this is not all. These all are institutional mechanisms. Important, but not the whole story. In the 1930s, the German lawyer and political scientist Karl Lowenstein already noted that the best guarantee for the survival of a democracy is its having a democratic tradition. That tradition needs to be cultivated, fostered, kept alive, and protected at crucial moments. Or as political philosopher and philosopher of science Karl Popper wrote, institutions are like fortresses. They must be well designed and manned. In the end, all depends on the people working in a democratic spirit that make our institutions function. They are the most important line of defense for our democracy. And it is, I think, precisely in that light that we should see Mr. Ignatieff's great efforts to keep academic freedom alive at the Central European University in Hungary. Thank you. Bastian, thank you. The book of Bastian, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is available in Dutch in uh, the Better Bookshop, in the Betere Boekhandel. But for now, we go uh, on to Michael Ignatieff. Give him a big hand. I should say Ignatieff, Russian descent, um, then went, your family went to Canada, that's where you teach brought up, back to both London and now Hungary, um, but you have been teaching uh, on a lot of diverse uh, universities like Oxford, Cambridge, you have been uh, made a lot of publication books, uh, you also write still for a lot of uh, important uh, and magazines and papers, um, it's almost impossible to, to, to show and to, to describe the, the broad uh, uh, amount of work you have been doing. But the last year, uh, last two years almost, you have been directing and being president of uh, the Central European University in Budapest. Um, well, that was a new challenge after you have been, uh, had a great political endeavor in Canada. Um, you have been a polit politician for about four or five years there. And I can expect that you were not prepared for another sort of political career. <laughs> um, yeah, when you introduce me that way, I feel I, I look I look at my wife who's over there, and I think, what a disordered life I've led. What? Where's the thread here? Um, and to your question, um, I refer to my wife because uh, one of the reasons I took the job is she's Hungarian and so for 25 years Hungary has been part of my life, my personal life. And so when this job uh, came up, um, I was aware that uh, as Betty Davis used to say, I should buckle up, it's going to be a bumpy ride. But I think I didn't have any idea quite how bumpy it would prove to be. But. Um, so maybe it's good that you give us an introduction on where is the current conflict about. Um, yeah. In late March, early April, the government of Hungary, without warning, consultation, anything, just blindsided um, the university with um, new legislation, which I could go into at tedious detail, but it essentially said you could only operate in Hungary if we had a new binding agreement with the Hungarian government. That is, we could only operate if we could secure agreement with the Hungarian government. We could only operate if we had a campus in the United States. We're an American university and a Hungarian university. We're one institution. We've never had a campus in the United States. And there are 30 American institutions around the world that don't have campuses. So we're not actually very exceptional. Uh, in addition, we would have to um, have new work permits and new visas. This is important because we have students from 120 countries and we have faculty from 30, 40 countries and visa control and immigration control are one of the great new threats to academic freedom around the world. They're used constantly by regimes everywhere, including the United States, 
to uh, regulate the capacity of universities to choose who, who studies and who teaches. And where did this, did this So we were concerned about all that, yeah. and we've been fighting that ever since. And just to kind of finish it off, um, since I like happy endings, we're <laughs> we stood up for our academic freedom. The picture that was up here a minute ago was one of the most touching experiences in our life. Those people, there were 70,000 of them, citizens of Budapest, who walked through the streets of Budapest chanting free universities in a free society. You have to be made of stone not to be touched by that. Never happens when, you know, people demonstrating in favor of a university. You must be kidding, right? So it was a wonderful moment. Uh, we have fought, we've had international support, and I'm pleased to say that since the end of June, there have been serious negotiations between the state of New York, where we're accredited, the government of Hungary. The government of Hungary won't talk to us, but they will talk to the state of New York. And I'm hoping, I got all my fingers crossed, please cross all your fingers and toes, that we will get an agreement that allow us to stay. End of story. But of course, main question is why in the beginning is the government of Hungary making it so difficult for you as, an, as a uni university? What is, do you think, the starting point? Well, I, it, it connects to, to our very good introduction. I mean, what is a democracy? One of the things that a democracy is that I don't think we think about is that it's not just majority rule. It's not just independent judiciary, it's not just minority rights, it's not just free media, it's also free institutions. I mean, the simple idea that institutions should be free to govern themselves. You know, Montesquieu and all these people thought that one of the marks of a free society is that you have self-governing institutions. You know, the pharmacists govern themselves, the doctors govern themselves, the lawyers govern themselves, God help us, and universities govern themselves. And I think what's been at stake in the, in the Hungarian case is that this is a government that is suspicious of, frightened of, and hostile to free institutions in principle. Mm -hmm. And um, we are not a political body. I am not mounting a challenge to the regime. I just want to be left alone. And uh, the people I work with and serve want to be left alone. So it's the role of free institutions in a democracy that's at stake here. And uh, we have fought back. I'd like to claim... Uh, but, but what have ignited their response? What was the reason you think they were sort of... Well, it's a complicated story. As you know, one of the key figures in the transition that Hungary made from the communist regime to democracy and capitalism was George Soros, a Hungarian born in Hungary, um, survived the Holocaust in Hungary, made a fortune, and then very unusually came back to Hungary in the late 80s, worked with dissident intellectuals to fund, among them, Viktor Orban. The young Viktor Orban received scholarships from Mr. Soros to go to Oxford. And, you know, uh, Mr. Soros wanted to encourage um, free institutions, free media, whatever. Uh, invested huge amounts of money in the Hungarian transition, and now for his pains is basically denounced as an enemy of the people. So there's a very bitter story about what happened to that bright moment of hope in 1989. It's now curdled. Uh, one of the leaders of the 189 revolution was Viktor Orban, played a very creditable role in that period, and is now leading a kind of conservative counter-revolution against the principles for which 1989, that moment, uh, was, was supposed to represent. And so it's a battle between Mr. Orban and Mr. Soros um, about where this transition goes in the future. Uh, that seems to be what's the case. And because our institution was f founded by the group around Mr. Soros and benefited from his investment and support, uh, we've been taken hostage in this battle. Uh, and uh, I think that's what's going so on. So part of a bigger political yeah. play yeah. in a way. Um, what do you think was the response of the EU? Was it, over the last months, um, active enough? Well, I, I love joining in the EU bashing. I'm, I'm kind of, I, I, I like going with the flow like everybody else. But I, I have to candidly say that, in fact, the European Commission put out some very forthright statements, uh, launched infringement proceedings, i.e. that the Lex CU was a violation of European law, 
not just a bad idea, not just a problem with values, but a violation of the law. Mm -hmm. um, the European People's Party, which is the center-right kind of coalition in the European Parliament, has said very tough things to, to Mr. Orban. I don't think that I can stand in front of you credibly and complain about European reaction. It's been not bad. Because the next stages all get very rough. You turn off the tap, you say you can't have any more European money, or we suspend your voting rights, or you, we throw you out. I'm not going to be party to that because it's way above my pay grade, but it raises fundamental questions, which I think, again, uh, Bastian's interesting talk raised, which is when a government in Europe begins to veer off a anti, uh, onto a non-democratic path, what are the resources available to other states to bring them back into the fold? There is a risk if you press too hard, you bounce them out of the union, and then where do they go? They go right into the lap of Vladimir Putin, who happened to be in Budapest on Sunday night. So you see there's some problems here. Uh, we wanted to defend democracy in Europe. We should defend democracy in Europe. But these are complicated questions of balance and political judgment. There was, of course, before criticism on Mr. Orban's uh, um, decisions uh, on, on other grounds as well. Do you see it as a sort of a bigger uh, um, action of the, the system of, of Mr. Orban? Do you see this as a, as, a, as a bigger way of thinking inside the Hungarian government? And what is this sort of thinking then about? Well, again, it's a, it's a what's at stake, again, sort of following off what Bastian led with and your question, this is about what democracy is. Mr. Orban will tell you, will be angry if I said he was anti-democratic. Mr. Orban said, give me a break. I've just won every election I've fought except one. I mean, he says, I'm elected here by the people. I'm the voice of the people. For him, democracy is majority rule, period. Uh, democracy is not checks and balances, it's not free media, it's not an independent judiciary, it's not free institutions. It's the will of the people expressed at the ballot. This is a position. It's a position with which I am in fundamental disagreement, and I hope many people who care and love democracy would be against it. But notice where it gets you. It says sometimes the people are wrong. Sometimes the power of the people needs to be checked with independent uh, institutions, courts, the media. Uh, notice Mr. Trump takes a very similar line. The press is the enemy of the people. The courts are the enemy of the people. Um, this is a fundamental battle of our time. Uh, and it, it's not good enough simply to say to Mr. Orban, you're not a Democrat. He says, I, had, I damn well am a Democrat. And, and this is where the battle is, is joined. Uh, and, and I think one of the things that uh, a very fine Bulgarian uh, theorist called Ivan Krastev, who I think is a friend of the Bali and has been around, has a point he's made which is very troubling is that, um, uh, you know, he says that these populist Democrats who, says, who say that democracy is just majority rule are extremely adept at making liberal democracy into the elite's defense of its privileges. So an independent judiciary is just a bunch of judges defending their privileges. The media are just a bunch of media pundits and um, uh, opinion formers who are too big for their britches, right? There's it's a very interesting way in which these populists and it can turn against liberal democracy and make it look like an elite game rigged to defend and support the privileges of the elite. And given that we live in very unequal societies that are very unfair, where lots of people at the bottom are not getting a fair shake, this sounds like a plausible story. And this is how you turn democracy against itself. And, and some of this is going on in Hungary. So do you consider Orban in that case a real threat to Hungary and Europe? Would you, would you say that? Well. You can take two views here. You can say there has been a systematic dismantling of the checks and balances of the Hungarian constitutional system since he came to power in 2010. Mm -hmm. Gerrymandering, altering the constitution, gerrymandering the political system, uh, suppression of the independence of the constitutional court, um, con increasing control of the free media. You can run that line. 
you can run a simpler line, which is he's just the smartest politician in the system, and he's wiped the floor with the opposition, and he would be beaten if, they, if there was strong opposition. I mean, in a way, both stories are true. There has been a systematic attempt to weaken the checks and balances of, of, a, of a democratic system. But at the same time, he's a very formidable politician. And, and the opposition is divided, weak, feuding. I heard a, a, a Dutch politician tell me recently there were two green Hungarian politicians she knew, and they were in different factions. They wouldn't talk to each other. Well, that tells you something. I mean, if an opposition can't get together and get its story together, he's going to be in there forever. So you, you've, got to give, you've got to give weight to both stories, I think. I'm not answering your question clearly. Is he a threat to Europe? Um, the, thing, the other thing he does, and you see this in Brussels, he comes right up to the red line every time. He pushes it right up to the edge and then walks back down, pushes it right up. Why? Because he knows the only destination that Hungary genuinely has is Europe. And, and so he can't cross the line. On the other hand, you can maybe credit him for the fact that he shows Europe a mirror for also his, its own, well, dualist behavior. Yes. And being and sort of tampering Eastern Europe by saying, you know, you're still not very developed, we should help you here. That's something I think Eastern Europe, especially also Hungary, feels not very positive about. Yes, and he, he, this is, I think, an issue for Western Europe. There's a kind of, I don't know what there is in this audience, I don't want to speak for you on behalf, and I may just be wrong, but there's a tremendous amount of condescension in Western Europe towards Eastern Europe, and, and he plays on that. He says, you know, I know what you feel. You go to Amsterdam and I think you're the poor cousin. Your sneakers aren't as good, your t-shirts aren't as good, you don't have as much money to spend, and these Dutch folks look down your noses at you. Well, I'm going to make you feel great. He plays on resentments, he plays on envies, he plays on hurt, he plays on a sense of Europe that's actually still almost as divided as it was culturally and spiritually as it was in the, in the communist era. And, and hung, Hungarians, like anybody, are very proud people, very proud of their language, their tradition, their contribution to Europe, as they should be. And they don't like people looking down their nose. And, and Viktor Orban plays that like a fiddle. And, it, and it, because he's a, any politician would, frankly. Um, so, and that's a challenge for Europe, to get beyond this, this stuff. Um, I, you know, I've spent 25 years in Eastern Europe. I, I can't quite figure out why, partly because I fell in love with a Hungarian and partly because I care about the, the region. And I, and I feel emotionally that Eastern Europe has taught Europe more about freedom than any other, any other part of Europe. I mean, you think about 56, who stood up against the tanks, 68, who stood up against the tanks, who taught us what trade unions really mean, you know, solidarity 1981, who actually brought the wall down. It was partly the Hungarians doing all that sneaky stuff about letting but, but the Germans you, go. You let so, us, so Eastern Europe has had a vocation of freedom, yeah. and if which you let often us Western that, Europe hasn't acknowledged. If you let us remember that, then it's an interesting question. Where is that sort of self-consciousness in regards of freedom gone? Well, I think I saw in, the, in, in that in that lead up video, someone saying you don't value freedom until you lose it or until it's at risk. I mean, I, I think that's very true. I think we, you know, freedom is not just a procedure. Freedom is not just I do what I want. Freedom is a whole political culture in which we share each other's fate, protect each other's freedom, uh, and, and in which we acknowledge its deep fragility. I mean, if, if you were in the United States right now, and I'm not, I'm not going to jump on the liberal foaming at the mouth about Trump, but you have to be seriously concerned about the future of the constitutional order of your country. And it's, I hate to say it, but it's actually a good thing because you wake up. You can lose this thing. Well, it really strikes me that you said in 2005 at Trinity College in Dublin on the Amnesty Lecture that we would not have international human rights without the leadership of the United States. Oh. I don't... 
I always like these old quotes coming back to <laughs> hunt you, hunt you, me yeah. and drag me down. No, I, that's a quote I will stay, stand by without, um, without um, too much uh, apologetics. I mean, why it rings oddly, obviously, is Iraq, is um, Vietnam, is moments when uh, Latin America, in which the use of American power was um, complicit in or actively uh, abusive of human rights. There's simply no question about that. But, like, you know, realities are complicated. I've always found the, some of the reflexive anti-Americanism in Europe just kind of dumb, really. Mm -hmm. Because as a historical fact, it wasn't until Jimmy Carter put human rights at the center of American po foreign policy in 1976 that every other European state quickly followed suit. It wasn't until uh, the Americans um, took, took that leadership that human rights was mainstreamed as the institutional priorities of other Western governments. It doesn't mean the United States leadership has been perfect, but if you have, as happened when Rex Tillerson, the new Secretary of State, came on and didn't even show up for the State Department's human rights reports this year, you knew something had changed. The United States was stepping back from that uh, in ways that I think should give everybody uh, pause, um, because the minute that happens, then we all become realpolitik, national interest, political systems, like that, overnight. And that should concern all of us. Response was in Europe, okay, let's take over that light. Let us do it. But in European, is Europe able to, to let that light, to, to have this on its shoulder? Well, it ought to. Uh, but, you know, it's kind of burned into my political education that when, um, as a Luxembourg foreign minister famously proclaimed in 1991, the wars in Yugoslavia are the hour of Europe, and Europe so signally failed for the next four years to stop a massacre within two hours flying time of this city, what then happened was that the United States stepped in and at, with, at Dayton with Holbrook, put a stop to it. So my answer to the question is conditioned by that history. It doesn't necessarily drive the future. There's a tremendous amount that the Netherlands can do, that Denmark, the Scandinavian countries have done to promote development, to promote human rights, promote freedom. But your gut freedom. feeling is to distrust the European uh, uh, quality of maintain position, peacekeeping? I have a... I have a yeah, there's a gut feeling that um, part of the gut feeling is also connected to being a Canadian because mm -hmm. we're great human rights promoters. But you don't want to be one of those countries that goes to the bathroom when the check comes in. Do you know what I mean? I mean, you want to be a country that's a serious country. You know, if you make a commitment to a place, you stick with it, you pay the bill. And sometimes, and this is the difficult issue for Europe, um, which made historic choices after the Second World War to not invest in the military, not invest in robust defense capacity. It's a paradox of human rights that if you wanted to prevent Bamako from falling to Islamic jihadists in, when was that, 2014, you actually have to send in the troops, and the French did, and so Bamako and Mali are kind of together. Sometimes, I don't say this always, but there are exceptional circumstances where the only way to protect populations effectively is to deploy military force, and if you don't have military capacity, you can't protect them. This is not to deny that in cases where we've used military force to protect human rights, it's ended very badly, Libya being the classic example. I don't want us ever to use military force except as a last resort, but if you're a serious country, you back moral commitments with capabilities, and you stick with it. And Canada has not been terrific at that, and Europe has not been terrific at that. The United States has not been terrific at that. But um, uh, so we need to bring these fine moral speeches together with capability and then stick at it. And the harsh reality that I think someone like me has, uh, um, we have to face is um, 
this marriage of moral commitment and capability has to be sustained, this gets us back to democracy, with consent, democratic consent. Uh, one of the weaknesses of you know, the kind of liberal internationalism that I believed in the 90s is we kind of glossed over the problem of consent. And one of the things that's come home in the United States in the last 15 years, and I think it's been an excellent reckoning, and Obama picked it up and Trump has picked it up, is that Americans are saying, I, we, we do care about human rights. That's not, you know, it is part of who we are. So, but I don't want my son and daughter to die out there. Mm -hmm. And I'm just not going to do it. And I think some of those of us who were in favor of the, the uh, militant defense of human rights neglected or, or didn't deal with the problem of democratic consent. And so eventually it was all bound to bite us. And, and this has happened right across the political spectrum. Obama was extremely hesitant, but the, uh, and so with Trump. And, and, and I think that reflects a, a new reality that's going to be very enduring. But the willingness to pay the price. You're saying, I don't want my son or daughter to die. Yeah. On the other hand, it was your mother, the friend with, I think his name was Frank, yeah. going into Second World War, knowing he was able to, he, was, he could be, be, be shut down or, or, oh. or, being, uh, or, or, be, or be dead anyway. He was finally, because he ended up in one of the camps. I mean, that, that generation was willing to pay the price. Yeah, if you're, I was born in 1947, and uh, if you're of this generation, and there may be some of you in the audience, we're all haunted by that reality, by, by the memory of the, uh, sac the, the willingness of people to, um, to die, uh, to fight and to die uh, in, a, in what turned out to be a very just cause indeed. And that well, particular case is one. So I think that shaped the moral conscience of, of, of my generation. But it's not going to shape the conscience of future generations because things change and, then, and new generations feel different uh, impulses. I think one of the trajectories that we took for granted, uh, and that is in part the subject of my new book, excuse the plug, plug now over, uh, <laughs> is that there, I think there was an implicit narrative that we ran I think strongly after 1989, but perhaps back to 1945, that economic and economic globalization would bring moral globalization in its wake. That as our world interrelates and interconnects and we all travel and all that, human solidarity would, would develop with it. Feelings of moral solidarity, compassion, interconnection to other people would grow over time. I think it's much more paradoxical than that. We're all aware that, in fact, as we've globalized, we've actually become more Dutch, <laughs> you know, more Canadian, more American, more fiercely dependent on those. In it. And the, the moral solidarity that we expected to accompany economic globalization, it's a much more complicated story. And so in the future, um, we can't take these transnational solidarities for granted at all. So back to that sort of moral awareness that maybe to defend a democracy, it also means that you must be prepared to die for it. I mean, Bastian said it's in the end about the position of individuals. Yes. And I think we... Um... And, in, in, and instead that you describe us in a way as going to the bathroom when the check, the check arrives. A little bit. And I, I, I mean, I, I, I think one of the things that that uh, maybe this will resonate with a, with a Dutch audience. It, 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 I would say it also of a Canadian audience, and I'd say it of our generation. You know, we, we were an incredibly lucky generation in one way that we never talk about. We talk about we all live longer, we've had benefits of medicine, we've had benefits of prosperity. We've had another benefit we never talk about, which is we lived in societies where we knew that the politics could never be so awful that it would screw up our lives. Do you know what I mean? I mean, we're contemptuous of our politicians, we're angry at them, cynical about them, but they could never really ruin the Netherlands. They could never really ruin Canada. And we knew, without really thinking about it, that there were countries where you could, you would draw the short straw of living in 
Nigeria, where bad politics could simply destroy the country, as it has done. Or, or I can think of 30 countries around the world where well, political systems... in the United systems, States, it means that you were sent out into a war when you were a young person. Yes, but even in the United States, once the draft was over, you could live in a political system where you, you just thought, how bad can it be? It can't be that bad. Mm. And, and that then bred a culture in which I don't think we invested very hard in freedom and democracy because it was kind of, it meant that politics was a kind of spectator sport. It was like going to watch Ajax or Eindhoven. You know, we had our team, and we, you know, and it was fun. And the end of the night, you know, somebody won and somebody lost, and we were momentarily upset that our party didn't win. But it, it didn't matter in some ultimate existential way. Whereas there are lots of countries where it is an existential matter who wins and who loses. And we are slowly, I think, backing into a world in which suddenly politics is returning in the sense that it does make an existential difference. There are people in the United States who, I think without being you know, swept away by liberal hysteria, have good reason to be concerned about their republic, to feel this is really different and this could be bad. And by bad, we don't mean something morally abstract. We mean 30 million people lose their first shot at health insurance, right? That's, that's a consequence, right? That, that's politics really coming in and grabbing you by the throat and shaking you, right? The way it is has been in Afghanistan or the way it has been in Venezuela. Venezuela is an example. There's a wonderful example where the world is divided into those countries where politics is a spectator sport and those countries where it's a matter of life and death. And we are lucky to be in a place where it's not life and death, but we should be worried that it might become that way. And before it becomes that way, let's care about our democracies. Let's care okay, about so our political Let's talk system. about that. What does that mean for our moral position as citizens in Europe? Well, I think there's a kind of easy cynicism about politics we should get away from. Mm -hmm. Of course, they're rascals. I was once one of the rascals. I know how rascally you can be. But uh, it's not merely the politics matters, but the politicians, the humble, imperfect instruments, delegates, representatives, our will matter. Um, if we want better ones, let's teach our kids to want to do that. Um, let's stop regarding it as a kind of uh, spectator sport that, that doesn't matter. Somebody said something earlier today, which I, maybe it was you actually, was yeah, we had dinner together, that's right. Um, I thought you said a very wise thing to me. You said one of the things that worries you about politics is the collapsing of time that that nobody in our political systems has the patience to understand that it takes time to do stuff. Your context was Macron. Yeah. Macron's put in reforms to the labor market. Are they the right ones? Are they? I don't know. But it surely can't be the case that the French public are able to decide today about legislation introduced yesterday. In the same way that I, my counterexample to you was, I read in the Financial Times today that you know they sent a reporter to a place in England and they said to a bunch of a community that had voted for Brexit, what do you think about Brexit? And they had three or four very serious, well-informed people saying, I'm extremely disappointed about Brexit. We should have been out by now. <laughs> I mean, someone literally said, well, I voted for Brexit and I thought it would take about four days. She literally said it. She thought it would take four days. And, and, and that's a problem. One of the things that's happened to our political culture is we have lost, we have lost patience. We've lost a sense of duration. We've lost a sense of time. And hang on, I don't want to give politicians alibis, right? I don't want to say, well, it takes, you know, politicians are always coming to us and say, it's very complicated, it takes a long time, give us some, pay, right? We shouldn't be patient well, with politicians. The good news in the Netherlands, we are in formation time already for about 150 days or so. Yeah. so we... Well, you're, you're among the most patient electorates in the world, so, <laughs> so that's fine. So that's the Zen but, but, moment. But you know what I mean, that, that you, 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 we, we've got to understand that political processes do take time, 
we should judge politicians severely, oh. but the social media world has collapsed time in ways that I think are making it very difficult to lead, for people to lead. One of the other threats you have been um, writing about is, is the upcoming nationalism, which you sort of combined with the fact that over the last years a lot of immigrants has come over to Europe. And in one of the latest interviews you have been given, you said, well, if you want to invite fascism in Italy, for example, just go on with that instead really thinking over the whole system. For example, having a green card system like you have in Canada. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Is that indeed the sort of debate Europe needs? And that is the sort of debate on, well, in a way, closing borders. Oh. Yeah, I... I this is such a difficult issue on the, to pick up the context of Italy. Um, if you have 160,000 people come in, mostly from North Africa, um, you have two political problems. One, you have a lot of Italians, not necessarily racist, not necessarily anti-immigrant, who just think, this thing is out of control, right? Um, Nation states, no nation state can operate unless it feels it has control of its borders. Who comes in and goes, it's the definition of what a nation state is. It's the definition of what a political unit is. And so it, it kind of just, um, that produces a reaction in any public, regardless of their politics, that it's out of control. Um, and so it's an imperative to get political control, which means borders, frontiers, border guards. You can come in, you can't, some criteria. Um, and the second issue has to do with the, this very vexed issue of the difference between migrants and refugees. What is eroding the support for refugee protection, which is enshrined in international law, open parenthesis, my grandfather, grandmother, and father were refugees, so I care about this stuff close parenthesis, but what's eroding the support for refugee protection is the systematic abuse of it by migrants. They're not abusing it in a, in a willfully destructive way. It's the way in, so they claim refugee status when it's clear that they're emigrating because they want to improve their life chances, and God bless them, if I was in Mali or Niger or Nigeria, I would want that. Um, it is striking to get to the details that the largest single group coming to Italy last year were Nigerians. Nigeria is not a failed state. Nigeria is a troubled burden state. It also has untold oil riches, which have been systemically squandered by the elites of all political persuasions since 1968. It is also riven by conflict between the Christians and Muslim populations and blah, blah, blah. So it's a, it's a burdened state. The solution, which seems to me to make sense, is for Europe to say two things. We are going to take Nigeria. We are going to do bilateral agreements with the government of Nigeria, which afford to Nigerians the following number of places in Europe every year. 20,000, 30,000, 40, whatever Europe decides is the number. That is a legal migration stream which will be policed by both countries. Everybody else is illegal and everybody goes home. The quid pro quo here is a legal migration stream which leads to a path to citizenship and corporation into Europe or a temporary uh, uh, labor migration stream. You can do both. But what it has to mean is repatriation of those who kind of swum ashore and don't actually either meet a refugee claim. It's close claim to the position of a lot of Eastern European EU member states. No, it's not. It's very different because Viktor Orban doesn't want anyone. He doesn't want okay. any migrants. He doesn't want any refugees. The Czechs are the same. The Slovaks are the same. The Poles are the same. But to be more close, I am not associated with that position. But to be more precise on who is entering the border, to be more uh, close on uh, bilateral uh, yeah. agreements, and to have a green card system as a yeah. whole, it's it's not something. The, the, the debate in in let's say Western Europe is already there. Sorry, it's already there? It's not already there it's in the not thinking. A, well, no. yeah, it, 
you better get there quickly is all I can say because you can't pre- you know you can't pretend somebody was saying to me the other night um, another open parenthesis none of my numbers are to be trusted uh, uh, but you know the population of Egypt just take Egypt is going to go is going to double in the next 30 years that's just Egypt think about all the other the 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 dynamics of population growth in Africa are enormous. Africa will go through the demographic transition like everywhere else, and those birth rates will come down with education, with economic growth. So it's, you know, but to get to that transition, there are going to be huge propulsive forces towards uh, Europe as a thing, because as people have pointed out, um, immigration is every man's revolution. It's every single person's way to radically transform their lives. And on the and other they hand, and no, and and this is where human sympathy is required. We can't ask people to sit in places where they can clearly see that life would be better for them, uh, even selling fake Gucci bags on the streets of Amsterdam than, yeah. than if they stay in a village that is being desertified by the spread of the Sahara and life simply stops. Because the thing we, these are familiar facts to you, but we need to appreciate their salience. You have a cell phone, they have a cell phone. You have pictures of the world, they have pictures of the world. You see that their life is poor. They see mm. our life is better. You, you can't stop it. They're coming. Okay. And uh, w- so then w- we have hold to hold it for the moment that. because uh, to to me, <laughs> to me it's. I mean, you're absolutely right. This threat is there, and we see for the moment that the policy making of the European Union is not uh, yeah. f- uh, making the solution for the upcoming years. It's it's just by the month in a way. So we need to think it through. On the other hand, we have all been just thinking about the open university thought, the open uh, society thought of George Soros. So we need to make a swift shift on that. I don't think, I I don't think it's a, (laughs) no society can be an open society unless it has boundaries. A society is not a society unless it has boundaries. That doesn't make me a nationalist. It doesn't make me a conservative. It just makes me descriptively accurate to what a society is. A society is not uh, a piece of amoebic plankton. It has boundaries. Netherlands is a place in space and time with a history. Um, And it's never going to be anything other than a place in state, although the composition the ethnic and demographic composition of the Netherlands has changed out of all recognition since 1945 and very successfully, but not without struggle, not without debate, not without controversy. It, this, will, this will go on, but that's what a democracy is there to do. Um, the other thing that I think is, is important to say, because Canadians have the tedious habit of going around the world telling everybody that they should really be Canadian, um, <laughs> I, I want to say I, I'm not saying that. Uh, the models of multiculturalism and multi-ethnicity that have worked well for us don't necessarily work in other places. We've got a lot of geography. We've got a lot of space. We haven't got a lot of people. We've been a country of immigration from, for you know, 150, 200 years. Um, I am, one of the things that living in Eastern Europe has brought home to me is... Um, and, and this is an urgent problem for European politics, um, those Eastern European countries are adamantly against forced imposition of refugee quotas. And I just don't know how we get around that, because if Europe insists on, Hungary, you've got to take 1,500 people, uh, Orban will be in power literally forever till they pull him out in a coffin, because there is resentment at having that choice made, because even if it's only 1,500 people, it's as if Europe is telling them, you've got to be this kind of society, and they just don't want to go there. There's a real issue of democratic legitimacy here, which is we just have to be honest and face. I, I think that any member of the European community 
signatory to the refugee conventions has obligations under international law mm -hmm. to refugees and must take them. And my university is proud to provide refugee education to you know, hundreds of bona fide accepted refugees because they are taking some refugees in Hungary. But if Europe insists on a, on a quota system, it could blow those places up. But what is the solution then? Because if you, I mean, you've been researching over the last years the idea of this common value system in Europe, which is the sort of dream where we're yeah. saying we're all open, we will be all have our, our same uh, responsibility towards this issue, because we are in one European value system. And then you tell me another 1500 and Orban is there forever. So something is definitely not working. Indeed. Um. This is an enormous challenge to... Um, and there is not a demonstration with 100,000 of Hungarians saying, yeah, we share the same values with Brussels, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. There is a deep... Um, you have to understand the specificity of a small country that speaks a particular language um, that nobody else understands. Like the Netherlands. That, like the Netherlands. <laughs> that ha no, that has a historic destiny, um, a, a, a specific historical identity. Um, the glory of Europe has been the fact that we're 27, 28 deeply different national cultures with deeply different histories who've managed to stop finally after three centuries killing each other. That's a, that's a big step forward. Um, and are um, struggling to defend these national particularities in the face of globalizing trends that seem to be destructive of what we care about most. Well, that's going on in Hungary too. Um, I don't think that's an excuse for barring the door. I think, don't think it's an excuse for evading your refugee obligations under international law. The thing I would say in raw political terms that I see right across Europe has been the political confiscation of compassion the political confiscation of mercy, mm -hmm. the political confiscation of generosity, so that any politician who stands up and speaks the language of mercy, compassion, and generosity is regarded as a sap who is about to undermine the national identity of the country in which he's standing up, or she's standing up. And that's been a disaster for Europe. Talk about European values. You must find a politics in which you balance border control, repatriation, some of the tough stuff I'm talking about, with compassion, mercy, you know, and generosity. And, and a politician who can find a language that says, I care about your, our national identity. We are, we are not a hotel. We're a place called the Netherlands. Right? We're not a hotel. If you come here, there are obligations to become a certain kind of person, respect a certain set of rights and obligations. But at the same time, the Netherlands is a place of compassion, mercy, and generosity. Right? And, and we've got to find a language that gets that into play. But this is much more than human rights. It's much more than international law. It's creating a space in which people can say, being generous and compassionate isn't being a sap or a traitor. And in Hungary, what is catastrophic, and this is where I feel, if I can express anger at the political system, not any particular individuals, is Everybody's forgotten that when the refugees arrived in Keleti Station in the hundreds of thousands, there were Hungarians handing out water bottles. There were Hungarians bringing beds. There were Hungarians trying to help these folks with their communication. And all of that has been suppressed by a narrative that says Hungary won't take anybody. Hungarians stand as one against any of this. This is what I mean by the confiscation of value. So back to your search for those common values. Have you found, indeed, this sort of common shared knowledge on the European level from Hungary to the Netherlands and from Sweden to Italy? Well, the book is actually not focused on Europe. Uh, again, short self-promoting interlude here. Um, it's a book that went around the world, so it includes okay. Myanmar and Japan and Brazil and all kinds of places. Um, it was a question about whether moral globalization has occurred along with economic globalization and whether specifically human rights has become a moral vernacular shared by mankind. Answer to that question, no. 
Um, what you do see, though, I think is enormously significant, and we forget just how hugely significant this is. Um, in 1945, if we were having a conversation in this room, um, there would be a lot of very decent, compassionate Christian Dutch people who would basically think, if you pushed them even a little bit, that they were born to rule um, Indonesians or people in the Dutch Empire. If you went to a conversation in France, it would be the same. The British would see the same. The vernaculars would be different, but the imperial assumptions were just basic to people who look like me and are of my generation. And within a generation or two, that's gone. We are in a post-imperial moral world, which means not a flat world, not a globalized world, but a world in which at least the starting point is we're all equal here. Now, everybody then knows we're not actually equal. That is, some people have life chances. Some people get, you know, the short end of the straw and die before they're five years old in lots of countries. But the moral premise is that no, no person is born to rule by virtue of their race. Um, no person is superior to any other by their race or their gender. These are enormous changes in the moral universe of, of the world. Hmm. Now, the paradox, to connect to what I said earlier, is that it's not necessarily breeding much more solidarity. Or morality. Yeah, it's, it just, and, and it has one very perverse consequence, which, which I, you know, <laughs> You write books and you always think, the French have this wonderful phrase, esprit d'escalier, that phrase about the things you s wish you'd said when you were at the top of the stairs and you only think of at the bottom of the stairs. Every writer has esprit d'escalier big time because you get it between the covers and then you think, God, there was something else I should have said. One of the perverse consequences of a world that is morally flat in that way, that is post-imperial in its assumption of individual moral equality, is that you then have this new phenomenon, which is dog whistle prejudice, dog whistle anti-Semitism, for example, where you say, I'm not anti-Semitic. I mean, I, I think we're all, all equal, but let me tell you some stories about the Jews, right? You get this weird thing in which you, you have an anti-Semitism that denies that it is. There's a lot of that around. You have a lot of deep hostility to blacks that is disguised by, I'm not racist, but it's, it's the genuflection that a new moral consciousness makes to this equality assumption that it's, that it's very uncomfortable with. And so we're in this world of a kind of hypocrisy that is, but I'd rather be in a hypocritical world than in an imperial world. Of all the things that's happened to us since 1945, becoming a post-imperial moral world is, I think, the most important thing that's happened to us and probably so the what best. Does, does, what does a case like Charlottesville means to you? Is it back to 1945 or is it just part of the mingle we're still in on well, our that, way to a I would moral... draw a different lesson from the Charlottesville uh, story, um, uh, which is that, and that's been a lesson for me, I, you know, I'm I'm a Canadian, I'm 12, 13, 14 when the civil rights movement starts. Um, it's vicarious because I'm not an American citizen, but of all the things that shaped me as a human being, I think probably shaped many people in this audience, that example of, of civic courage by uh, black Americans was just completely transformative. I just, it can move me to tears even to think about it still. But the thing that you then get yourself into that you're not being honest about is you think it's over? Well, You I, think when, when this great struggle won the Voting Rights Act, that this great struggle won uh, enormous victories, and then you think, okay, that's done, we're done here. And it's, you're never done. You're never, the thing about these stories is that it, it's never over. There will always be somebody who wants to start um, uh, remembering the Confederacy 
fondly. And there will always be people who say, you remember the Confederacy fondly, you're forgetting slavery. And the battles will go on. And I think that's been a shock to everybody because you think moral progress is, is a one-time story. It, it, you know, we're rising up and we win these victories and they remain victories and they can't be lost. It goes back to, I think, things we were saying about the fragility of democracy. These battles are simply never over. Hmm. We shouldn't be surprised or shocked that there are Southerners who feel when you pull down a statue, it's, a, it's an assault on an identity that they care about. Okay, last question. And then we will open up uh, questions for the audience. We start with, with, with Bastian. Um, what does this mean for you, overseeing this, as being a Canadian, looking at uh, the last developments over, over especially what we have been talking about the last 10 years, so, or to, so to speak? Are you positive? Um, I think enormously so. Um, no, the discovery that no gains are permanent, that democracy can be lost, that freedom can be lost, that this commitment to human equality can be um, uh, violated by this kind of hypocrisy of dog whistle prejudice. Um, it just says the battle's not over and, and we, we have to roll up our sleeves and get serious and, and keep going. And, and one of the most difficult things, I think, about being you know, an incorrigible liberal progressive is that you have to do it without any consoling narratives about history being on your side. One of the, the wisest things ever said, and it's taken me a lifetime to understand the truth of it, is a remark that Isaiah Berlin used to love, and it was a remark delivered by Alexander Herzen, a great 19th century Russian socialist, a man who lived through the disillusionment of the Decembrist uprising, 1848, 1870, who, who lived th three successive defeats of his dreams. And he said at one point, you know, history has no libretto. And this is a very deep thought. History has no libretto. History is not on the side of liberal progressivism. History is not on the side of the Netherlands. History doesn't give a goddamn about you, me, or anybody else. History is going to do what history is going to do. It's extremely important for us to understand it, but we can only understand it looking backwards. We can't understand it going forwards. And it is humbling, and it should be humbling, uh, to cease the belief that liberal progressive causes are aligned with the, the vectors of history. Uh, but that doesn't then mean that we should be pessimistic. It just means roll up your goddamn sleeves and fight. That's what I think. Thank you. Bastia, maybe you can respond with the first uh, remark question and then we will open up for the rest of uh, people present here. Please go of ahead. Of course. Um, there were so many interesting points that it's hard to choose, of course, but um, here's only one. Um, you've explained how Orban would never describe himself explicitly as someone who's against democracy. Um, and part of Orban's story in that respect is that he, does ev he says that he does everything in a legal manner. Uh, we have seen this when the renowned judge Andras Baca was pushed out of the constitutional court by supposedly neutral laws. Um, could you maybe explain how the, the law is utilized in Hungary um, for sometimes illiberal uh, means? Yeah, yeah this is a, I, I, li I like to widen out beyond Hungary a little bit. I, I you know, I've taught human rights a lot, and many of you will be familiar with the distinction between rule of law and rule by law. It's a way to understand China, for example. You don't have rule of law in China because you don't have an independent judiciary. Uh, you have party domination of the courts, and you have party domination of the uh, prosecutorial function, and so, but you don't have complete lawlessness. 
you have rule by law in the sense that you can get predictive results. You can, you know, the Dutch companies invest and work in China because they can get handshake deals and stuff that can guarantee the security of their assets, even though there isn't, a, you know, there's, there's lots of regulation and it provides regularity and continuity, but it's not rule of law in that, in that sense. And this is a global phenomenon. It's in China and I think there's a lot of rule by law in Hungary. That is, it's not a lawless place, it's full of law. It's just you don't have any independent verifiable form of appeal. Um, Lex CU is a piece of law, a very carefully f constructed little machine to whack one institution. Um, and the rhetoric of the regime is, you know, who does CU think it is? It thinks it's above the law. I mean, you know, the, so they're using the law to, uh, as a nakedly political instrument, and they use the law to, dis to disguise the nakedly political element of, of what they're trying to do. And this, so there's a kind of, not just in Hungary, but in lots of places, <laughs> legalism in place of law, legalism to actually destroy the rule of law. So, you know, they use the law to, to erode what we mean by the rule of law. Everything they do to, to weaken the rule of law is done with legal forms. And so it's a very shadowy world you're in. And I constantly spend my time with, with dealing with... Um, um, Hungarian uh, administrators firing punctilious legal questions at me to cover what is in fact a flagrantly political attack on the independence of an institution using the law. And uh, that's concerning because it then is disguised from the public. The public thinks, what do you mean we're not a rule of law country? There's lots of law around here. What, what's your problem? You see, and, 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 and that's... Uh, one of the new forms that, um, uh, new forms in which the relationship between law and politics is being expressed in the 21st century, not just in Hungary, but in lots of other places. And let me make it clear, you know, Hungary is not China. Um, uh, Hungary is not a police state. China is a police state. There are political prisoners in China. There are not, to my knowledge, political prisoners in Hungary. Everything is what it is and not another thing. I'm not saying that to make nice to Hungary, but I think it's extremely important to keep things distinct and clear in our minds. Okay, thank you. Tim, other questions? Yeah. Uh, dan neem ik even deze microfoon en kan je daarna aan de gang. We komen even bij u. Gaat die gang. I have a question for your wife, if it's possible. <laughs> well, a question for you both of you. I'm so impressed by that we can't uh, fight Hungary and ask them to take the refugees. But can your wife tell us what we can do when we think about compassion, mercy and generosity? How can we seduce Hungary? <laughs> um, a, a, a very unusual thing is about to happen. My wife is allowing me to speak on her behalf. Uh, <laughs> You have, you have the, your own and, microphone. And so that mean, oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Uh, and, and that means I'm going to be in real trouble afterwards. Um, <laughs> almost whatever I say. Um, I, I think one of the things that you, you see in Hungary is that there are a lot of people struggling against considerable odds to display compassion, mercy, and uh, um, towards... Uh, strangers and, and foreigners. Um, the official political discourse confiscates these virtues and then they keep kind of pumping up. Uh, why am I able to teach, why is my university able to teach refugees? Because we have volunteers from our faculties who step up and want to give their Saturdays and Sundays to this. Why um, do these refugees get in at all because um, very courageous Hungarian lawyers uh, acting pro bono will make a refugee uh, case 
uh, and they can sometimes get it through the bureaucracy. This is the exercise of generosity using the law. Um, I think were the discourse less adverse and hostile, were the discourse less any time you show mercy to a foreigner, you're betraying true Hungary, there was less of that, the generosity would begin to, to grow. But I've, I've also made the point, which I think is important, each of these countries have, has very different histories. Um, uh, it is very easy to trigger hostility towards Muslims in Hungary, not because Hungarians are more racist than anybody else, but because they have a history as a frontier of the Christian Europe in the south faced with the Ottoman Empire. So there's a whole history you can conjure up like that, which is different than the history of other countries. And it, this is not to say, let's excuse Hungary, but it's to explain the context in which the confiscation of mercy and generosity and compassion becomes so, so easy in Hungary. The other thing that's important is we need to remember that between 1945 and 1989, these were closed societies. They were shut off. Um, they had very careful, carefully cultivated forms of solidarity with foreign countries, but basically they didn't see many foreigners. So there are a lot of specificities about Hungary that need to be understood, not to, not to acquit the regime of its um, uh, failings, but simply understand the context in which their confiscation of generosity becomes possible. And now after dinner, I'll get, after as I walk home, I'll be told what I ought to have said. So. Okay, another question over there. Hello, uh, Teodora Gedita from Free University of Amsterdam. Um, I have an impression that Hungary actually consists of two societies. Uh, on this picture we see these young, educated, more successful people who were fighting for university, of course. But my general, general question is, uh, who are the supporters of Orban or the regime, also Jobbik, and are these people who have nostalgia for pre-communist past, post-communist uh, uh, past, or um, are these older or younger people? And if these are younger people, so is it maybe worrisome because um, mm -hmm. it yeah. would not, yeah, Orban still stay and it would not pass away with a generational change. Thank you. Okay. I, it's a very good question and, it, it, uh, and I better fess up and tell you, um, I'm, I can't give you a, a, an expert answer. There's, there's one thing you're, you're, you're putting your finger on, which is again, a comfortable illusion of liberal progressives always is that the kids must be on our side. You know, the more education you have, the more urban and sophisticated you are, the more liberal and progressive you're bound to be. That's false in lots of countries, and it may also be false in Hungary in the sense that there are lots of people, uh, young people, doing pretty well in the regime, uh, in, in current Hungary. And so the regime does have support because uh, there are lots of, you know, the Hungarian economy is growing at 3%. There are a lot of actual beneficiaries of European accession. Um, the, the regime is re, re, reproducing um, uh, support. Um, it is not the case that its only basis is conservative, rural, small town. Uh, that's just an illusion you tell yourself to say this can't go on forever. There's no reason why it couldn't go on forever because the regime is re reproducing support among uh, young people. Um, but so let's rid ourselves of those uh, happy illusions. I, I think the key thing is that the, the opposition to the regime is weak, divided, and in many ways incompetent. And I don't, I actually am optimistic about Hungary in the sense that I think if, if there was a strong and concerted opposition, I don't, can't understand all the reasons why it's so divided and so incompetent. Some of the reasons are that the previous socialist regime disgraced itself, was, was uh, convicted, was regarded as highly corrupt. And so the current prime minister has a kind of four-lane highway he can drive down. There's nothing giving him much opposition. 
but you shouldn't infer from that that he's hegemonic, as Gramsci would say. I mean, you know, if he gets competition, he'll have a fight on his hands. I don't, I don't have any contact with the opposition. I'm not shilling for them. I don't know anything about them. But I've been in politics, and the minute you get a good opposition standing up, you've got to fight on, and that would be interesting for Hungary, and they would have a chance to... My sense is that Hungarians don't have a properly framed set of electoral choices. And were they to have one, well, then we can't predict what will happen. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, Tim. Hi. Um, my name is Julia, and I'm about to start a graduate program in Refugee and Forced Migration Studies, which is why I'm wondering, you were talking about us, um, the Netherlands, but other European countries as well, having a democratic tradition and experiences with, which makes it maybe less urgent for us to fight for it in this battle for democratic freedom. What do these newcomers to Europe and maybe also to democracy bring to us? Are they an opportunity or maybe do they make our battle more difficult because they have no history of democracy? What's your take on it? Um, I think that's an issue. I think often liberal progressives are a little wary of touching that. You know, people come from Syria, they've never known what a democracy is, and they arrive in a West German reception center or a German reception center. You know, how do you take someone who's been a Syrian farmer or a pharmacist under the Assad regime all, all their lives? How do you get them to realize they've got electoral choices, they've got, um, you know, society debates questions like the status of women and the position of women. That's a, that's a public choice that we make as opposed to a choice dictated by you know, religious authorities. You know, I, I think these are real issues, and I, I think it's important not to brush by them and pretend they don't, they don't exist. And but I, even closer by, she says, is it really a, a profitable thing that Hungary has become part of the European Union and Poland and so on, countries who have not uh, developed so long this democratic tradition? Well, I mean, what, what, what's your alternative? I mean, you, you, you know, we, we, we could have the Soviet Empire at the, you know, at the German frontier, if that's what you prefer. I'd actually like to have uh, freedom right to the Russian frontier. And again, I would emphasize it is true. Let's take Hungary. It is true they have had a horrible 20th century. Horty between 1920 and 1945, then the outright fascist regime at the end of 45, which was exterminatory. Then the communists, um, bloody, repressive, uh, fear instilling. And you can feel in Hungarians, um, they have many of a certain generation remember that when they talked about politics, they lowered their voices or didn't have a conversation in a restaurant. This is still in the, in the reflexes of a whole generation of Hungarians. So, yeah, it's, it's, that's why the transition is morally so important to me. You've got to get these reflexes out of you. It's not just a matter of creating good institutions or passably decent politicians. It's getting that reflex of fear out of your system. And when people are very pessimistic about 21st century Hungary, they say, we've started to lower our voices when we talk about politics. You know, the old reflexes are come back. Um, and now, so... You know, part of what makes me so committed to Europe is it's not just a, a club of people who already know what democracy is. Europe is a school for democracy. And frankly, it's a school for democracy for all of us. Not just the poor, benighted Eastern Europeans who don't know any better. We're all at school, frankly. We're all, you know, why are we having these discussions? Because we're trying to figure out what the hell this word means to us. Okay. Uh, a lot more questions. Uh, Tim, where are you? Uh, okay, we start there in the audience uh, upstairs and then we work our way down. Yep. Uh, thank you for your very balanced uh, talk here tonight. I find it very hard in this climate of, <coughs> excuse me, polarization to sort of walk the, the middle path, which I, I tend to find mo most um, it, it usually seems to be the, 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 the path that leads to sort of a, uh, a way out of 
strife and and possibly possibly war. I no. mean that that's that seems often to be where 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 the, we're headed somehow. So what's your question? <laughs> How? Yeah. I'm, Sorry. When you have a narrative, there's usually a counter narrative. How to, how to find the f how to sift the facts from the alternative facts? Because Orban, as, as much as he he may be a, a terrible figure, has has a narrative regarding, yeah. for example, George Soros, who you mentioned. Who? Well, we we could go into that. Yeah. But that would make this question even longer. There's like a whole conspiracy theory behind. How, how George Soros may be influencing politics sure. in a destabilizing manner, for example. Yeah. Um, but, well, we, we, well let, me, let me talk a little bit hard. about <laughs> those uh, narratives. Um, politics, as you're, as you're implying, is a battle over narrative. Um, I often think that the polarization of politics now is no longer between left and right. It's about identity on the one hand, and it's about reality on the other. It's literally about whose version of what is real will prevail in political argument. And so taking that example, you know, the Prime Minister Orban's view of the world is that, or the narrative he's is presenting, is that there is a billionaire plutocrat with no fixed allegiance to any country who's manipulating the politics of every country in Europe to isolate Hungary and reduce its influence and power, to flood the country with immigrants and to damage its national cohesion. That's the narrative. And believe me, that's the narrative that's being run. And so then you have to, you have to unpack that narrative. And you have to ask, for example, where does that funny narrative come of the billionaire, rootless, cosmopolitan speculator who ruins the lives of millions come from? Where have we heard that narrative before? A minute's reflection tells you we have heard that narrative before. Okay? So you then unpack the sources of that narrative. That is what I'm talking about is dog whistle anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism that says, I'm not anti-Semitic. But it is just a fact that billionaire, rootless, cosmopolitan speculators ruin the lives of ordinary, hardworking people. Right? That's what, so you, you got to unpack that stuff. You've got to then apply. I'm not Mr. Soros' spokesman. I am not answerable to him. It's not my job. But you ask a question about narrative, you have to go out there and say, let's look at the facts. What has Mr. Soros said about migration? What has Mr. Soros done? How many facts would you like on this? You can't refute the narrative with facts, but if you don't put some counterfacts out there, you'll be swept away. All right. Uh, let's do some uh, questions in this part of the audience, Tim. Yeah, and then we see where we are because uh, we have limited time as well. Okay, go ahead. Thank you very much. I'm uh, Christina Varga, Chargé d'Affaires uh, at the Interim the, of the Embassy of Hungary. Welcome. And um, I would like to first say that uh, we find it a pity that even though the subject of tonight is, is Hungary, uh, and my ambassador or the representative of the Hungarian government was not invited. It, he was invited, but he is not here. No, he, uh, as far as I know, he was not invited. That's he, not true. he would like, he wanted to participate, but he did not have the chance. Um, but well, I if, understand he has been invited, but you are here, so please yes, go ahead. Yes, I'm here. So I would not like to pose a question, but I would like to make some remarks on what uh, Mr. Ignatieff said. First of all, you posed the question why this Lex CEU was was introduced, and I must say that uh, the Hungarian Educational Authority carried out an examination and uh, figured that there, there were uh, several irregularities uh, in the work of uh, foreign universities, and therefore, uh, as in all societies, it was very important for the Hungarian government that all universities comply with the rules. Okay, but um, that was okay. First of all. Can, can you make it into a question, because then it yeah, Mr. Well, can respond. Yes, uh, I just would like to make comments, as I said. Uh, I don't want to okay. pose questions. I would, like, I would only like to highlight that you know, there is another side of the coin, 
uh, which could be interesting for the audience because there were several so, questions. So, so in order to yes. limitize the time a bit, what's your main comment you'd like to make in short and then we can go from there. Okay, so you were talking about the rule of law and Hungary and whether the European Union reacted to the different Hungarian uh, laws back in 2010, 2011. And uh, I must say, as you probably all know, that the, uh, that the European Commission initiated several infringement procedures. So the Hungarian legal system is one of the best scrutinized legal systems in the European Union. We have changed several laws. Uh, and if we had uh, quarrels with the European Commission, we discussed. Uh, so I don't think that there is any threat in Hungary towards the European Union as Hungarians, around 80% of the Hungarians are pro-EU. And we are for a strong EU. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. A short response. Well, I, I'm... Um, uh, I welcome your presence here. Um, everywhere I go, a uh, representative of the Hungarian government shows up. You're very, you're, I, I feel. I guess it's our job. I feel we're bond, bonded for life. You know, er, everywhere I go, a Hungarian diplomat comes and thank you for being here. Let me just emphasize uh, one point briefly. Um, you mentioned irregularities. It's an important question. Um, we have asked the Hungarian government to demonstrate to us what irregularities they're talking about. No irregularities have been found in our file or in our procedures. We care greatly about being compliant with Hungarian regulations. So the constant reiteration that there are irregularities is an unsubstantiated allegation that it would be in your interest to strike from your talking points. That's number one. Num num Number two, uh, you're aware that the government of Hungary is in discussions with the state of New York. Let me make it as clear as I can to you and to the audience that CEU very much wants those negotiations to succeed. We want to create a new basis for a long-term relationship with the authorities in Hungary that allows us to remain in Budapest, which has been our home for 26 years. Okay? So that's possibly, I hope, common ground between us. It is in the interest of the Hungarian government, as I understand it, and it is in the interest of CEU, which is not at the negotiating table, to come to that agreement, and I hope it will happen quickly. Thank you. All right, thank you. I will take the last three questions because of the time. So we have one here and maybe some part of the audience over there. Yeah, please go ahead. My name is uh, Harry on Colling Benning. I'd like to address you as a Canadian politician or as a former Canadian politician, so moving away from Europe and Hungary. Um, I've always been intrigued by the huge difference in the societies in Canada and the United States. And I wonder whether you have any type of explanation how these countries that both are composed of immigrants have developed so differently and added to that I'd like to know whether you believe that democracy is threatened in the US at this moment. Mm. Um, that's a great uh, uh, question. Um, it's one of the reasons why when um, when people talk about the West or they talk about Western democracy um, I become increasingly convinced that the differences are extremely important. Um, Canada, we look like them, we sound like them, we talk like them, we root for the same teams, and yet our political system, and we share the same geography in lots of ways, we're a little colder, but it's kind of the same story. We're immigrant societies, exactly as you described, we've got lots of real estate. We're escaping the tyrannies of Europe, all that. You know, we've got similar narratives. And yet our institutions have ground out incredibly different democracies. In part, in Canada, because nous avons une population française. We've had to, we were confronted with difference out of the gate. How do you, how do you create a common political culture 
uh, from a majority Protestant and a minority Catholic population, Francophone, Anglophone, uh, two different legal systems. The, the condition of our survival, the condition of what then made us this different, is that from the beginning we had a problem we had to solve, an existential problem of living together. And we've had a huge difficulty doing it at all. The other element distinctive to our story is Aboriginal. We got a million of my fellow citizens plus are of Aboriginal origin. And they have a very contested narrative. They're, they're not necessarily feel they're part of our story. And so Canada's survival as a political institution has been much more parlous and uncertain. We're smaller, we're stretched out, second largest democracy and landmass in the world. And because our survival has never been certain, we can't take anything for granted, and it's forced compromise into our bones in somewhat the same way that the particularities of the Dutch experience, the confessional differences, um, various parts of your history have forced compromise into your bones. Uh, the American story is just different. Uh, and, and, and so it's a parable about the enormous importance of political institutions and starting conditions in generating different national cultures. And then your second part of your question is, is you know, how we think about the future of democracy in the United States. I think the thing that is worrying about Trump is not actually Trump, but that he comes at the end of a 40, 50 year period of institutional decline. You know, Trump is the consequence of something, not the herald of something to come. He's the consequence of electoral gerrymandering. He's the consequence of the poisonous impact of money on politics. He's the consequence of a kind of light-minded polarization. Uh, he's the consequence, by light-minded polarization, it means people having strong opinions because it's so much fun to have strong opinions, not realizing that it puts the whole republic in danger if you keep having strong opinions unmoored to judgment and caution and prudence. I mean, there are loyalties much higher than party. They are loyalty to the republic, loyalty to the system. And those loyalties have been eroded systematically by a lot of pandering on the left and on the right, actually. Okay, and, thank you. And, and then uh, just, you know... Um, Keep it and, for a moment. We go to the next question. All right. <laughs> Please. Hello, uh, my name is Ayman. I'm a Tunisian. I work in, I live in the Netherlands for already seven years here. I have a question about um, what you mentioned a few moments ago. You said that the, the, the starting point now is equality between everyone, um, but there is a hypocrisy and a, we'd rather live in a hypocritic world than in an empire. Mm -hmm. um, I made the link between that and the tension that exists nowadays between, for example, in the Netherlands, between Dutch people that are historically Dutch mm -hmm. uh, and people that come from, that are born in the Netherlands but come from different backgrounds. Yeah. And how they see that, they see that kind of hypocrisy and how it increases, in my opinion, the, the, the tension. Mm -hmm. Do you see that that way also? Or how do you see it, 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 it moves also forward in, in, the, in the future? Oh, I, th I think there's simply no doubt that um, I don't think this is just an issue for uh, the Netherlands, but you've raised it in that way, but it, it's a general question. All our societies are facing up to the, the consequences of a post-imperial moment in which we formally commit to the equality of all human beings. Problem one, we can't forget the imperial past. Tunisia was part of an empire. Um, other countries have bitter imperial memories in relation to the Netherlands, in relation to wherever. So the history, we, we have a normative commitment to equality that, and we have trouble forgetting the history. Then we have the other problem, which is that um, despite a normative commitment to equality, we're stubbornly convinced that there's a difference between born, being born and bred in Holland and coming here as a, as a newcomer. And so we have a contradiction between what we say on the packet 
you know, the, the Dutch packet on the front of the packet says, you're all equal here and you're all welcome provided you sign up to a few values. And then when you get inside, you discover actually there's a kind of, it, it doesn't work that way. And so all of these societies, Canada has some of the same problems, are faced, are driven by, it's a productive tension, are driven by the conflict between what we say and what we do. So what I'd urge you to think about it, and I'm sure you think about it much more than I have, is because you live it, uh, is hypocrisy can be a productive tension. Because you're in a society where you can say, listen, this is what you promised, God damn it. So stop talking about it, start doing it. And the society then struggles with what then ensues. And in Canada, we have this as well. We say Aboriginal Canadians are equal. We say immigrants are equal. And in fact, we make substantial difference between those who call themselves born and bred in Canada, those who come new. And, but that, it's not enough simply to say this is an insufferable hypocrisy. This is a tension that you then have to work forward and force the society to change. And, and that's why these societies are very dynamic. The conversation you and I are having right now will be very different in 10 years' time. Very different in another 20 years, I hope. On the other hand, you were questioned being a real Canadian in your political career, being out oh, yeah. of yeah. Canada for years. Oh, yeah, yeah. Feel my pain, how I suffered, you know. <laughs> okay, last question. Uh, Tim is going to decide here, yeah, please. It will be very short. If you talk about Europe as a school for democracy, would you think that the EU is attending class? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't hear the last sentence. Okay. W would, you, would you think that the European Union as such is also attending class? Yes. Yeah, well, I hope so. I hope so. Um, uh, I certainly hope so. I mean, this is an unprecedented historical experiment. Europe invented the nation state. Europe invented nationalism. Europe invented national identities. And Europe is the first continent to invent supranational transnational government. Shared and pooled sovereignty. It's been going for barely two generations. It's one of the most consequential experiments ever tried. And it's an experiment seeking to overcome catastrophe. Europe had a catastrophic 20th century. And this is the only way to escape tragedy. And so that's why we're all at school. We're at school in democracy but we're also at school in trying to find a way out of the prison house of national hatred. And, and this is all hard, but it seems to me infinitely worth doing. It seems to me the kind of project you really do want to hand on to your children and grandchildren. Okay. Thank you, um, Bastian Rijpkema, for your column and introduction. And thank you, Michael Inactive, for your very precise and clear, um, well, answering questions and uh, putting up a lot of uh, difficulties for the upcoming future. Your book is just being translated. It's the first translation next to the English one here in the Netherlands. And I understand you are now um, willing to sign some of them if people want that. And that can be done right upon Thanks. the entrance. Thank you. Thank you so much. That no, was a welcome. good session. No. You did a very good job. I appreciate well, it. Thank you. Thank you so much.